Hey everyone, my name is Nikki Young and this is Serial Napper, an international true crime podcast. Tonight I'm covering a case that needs far more attention than it's received so far. 22-year-old Justin Evans would be reported missing shortly before Christmas of 2020. His disappearance was highly suspicious to those who knew him, and his family pushed for answers. Approximately five months after being reported missing, Justin's body would be discovered near his home, and the police would say that they didn't believe it was a homicide, which would either leave an accidental death or suicide. But once you hear the facts of this case, the stories told by the last people to see Justin, and all of the lies and inconsistencies, you're going to see why Justin's family and friends have publicly pushed back against the police conclusions. And just today, there's been an important update in Justin Evans' case that blows this whole thing wide open again. Let's start with a little bit about who Justin was. Justin Evans was a 22-year-old young man from Kilworthy, Ontario in Canada. According to those who were close to him, he was a laid-back, kind, responsible person who spent a lot of time with his extended close-knit family. His mother posted this about him on Facebook. He was a happy 22-year-old young man. He would visit home, my home, often. Not every weekend, but often. He spoiled his youngest sister, Maddie Wise, and loved lounging around with his other sister, Kristen Wise. No siblings could be closer. They would spend hours together talking, watching TV, or shopping. Justin often bought Maddie over whatever she hoped for. He was very generous. He'd take his sisters out for breakfast almost every morning he visited. Justin was a great cousin. He had more than 10 cousins, 13 and under. He dressed up as a clown with his sister, the ringmaster, this year, just so we could give the little ones a great COVID Halloween, where each adult set up their own station to trick-or-treat at. He worked in his grandparents' store, Wise Choice, until he turned 18. Many customers remember him and ask for updates. Justin loved to fish, and we had a great time this summer when he took me out fishing. He loved outdoor activities with his stepdad, James Bolton, fishing both summer and winter. They'd both just bought sleds for the winter. He never missed camping with us in the summer. At the time of his disappearance, Justin was living at the Muskoka Mobile Home Park in Kilworthy with his best friend since childhood, Bud, Bud's girlfriend, Kiara, and Bud's grandparents, Glenna and Ken McKinney. He worked full-time with Bud, and he worked shift work, so he would work from midnight until 8 a.m. the next day. The two would drive in together because Justin didn't have his driver's license, so Bud would give him a ride to and from work each shift. When Justin had time off, he would usually spend it in his shed, working on his motorbike, snowmobile, or just tinkering with stuff as young men do. Or he would spend it with his family, like I previously mentioned. He was super close with his family, and he was known to take off to spend time with them, but he would always make sure to let everyone know what his plans were. Home life at the trailer was a bit complicated. While Bud had been one of his best friends for many years, I mean the two had been friends since kindergarten, Bud's girlfriend Kiara, who also lived at the trailer, didn't like Justin. So, as you can imagine, this would create some tension in the home. They also lived with Bud's grandmother and grandfather, Glenna and Ken, who were more like Bud's parents as they had raised him. Ken was known to be an alcoholic, and when he would drink too much, there had been instances of physical altercations between him and Bud. Even with all of this, Justin was said to enjoy living there, having his own space, and he contributed to the household expenses. Now, let's get to the last day that Justin was reportedly seen alive, which was Saturday, December 12, 2020. According to Glenna, Bud's grandmother, she feeds Justin breakfast early that morning, and she said that everything appeared to be normal. Justin was acting like he usually did, and nothing was out of the ordinary. While Justin was eating breakfast, Glenna says that he tells her he plans to work in his shed around 8.30 a.m., 
The shed is located just at the back of the property behind the trailer. And as I mentioned, this is a place where Justin would frequently go to just hang out, listen to audiobooks, and tinker with things. According to Glenna, this is the last time that she saw him. Bud and Kiara would tell a different story that would kind of contradict this statement. The two of them decided to get up early that morning to head into Barrie to do some Christmas shopping, and they say that as they were pulling out of the driveway, they saw Justin in Ken's shed around 7 a.m., and Bud waved goodbye to Justin. Now, Ken's shed is a completely different shed than Justin's shed, and we have no idea or insight as to why Justin would have been in there. And why would he be in there if he's reportedly eating breakfast around that time and talking to Glenna about working in his own shed around 8.30 a.m.? We don't know, but Glenna would later kind of waver on her statement, saying that she wasn't totally sure if she had actually fed Justin breakfast on the Saturday morning or if that maybe it was the Friday morning instead. Bud's grandfather, Ken, told police that he went with Bud and Kiara shopping in Barrie, but the two of them would deny that, saying that Ken was lying. Either way, these are reportedly the last sightings of Justin. Bud and Kiara head towards Barrie, Ontario to do their shopping, picking up two people along the way to go shopping with them. At around 3.44 p.m. later that afternoon, Justin's mom, Jamie, receives a text message from Justin's phone. It was a brief text telling her that his time off hadn't been confirmed yet for Christmas. It was unusually short for what was a typical message from Justin, and now Jamie says she isn't even sure if the text really came from Justin or not. It was from his phone, yes, but it was an unusual message. You know how you can usually identify certain ways that people text? Well, according to Jamie, this message didn't look like how Justin would usually text. And this would be the last time she received any text messages from his phone. Kiara and Bud say that they get home from shopping in Barrie later that evening, and there's no sign of Justin at the trailer. He's not in his shed, and they figure that he's either sleeping in his bedroom or away spending time with his family. Justin doesn't show up for dinner that evening, and again, they say that this is typical for him because he frequently sleeps through dinner. Nobody checks his bedroom to see if he's in there, they just assume. The next day is Sunday, December 13th, and both Bud and Justin are scheduled to work that evening from midnight until 8.30 a.m. the following morning. Kiara states that when they wake up that morning, Justin's lights weren't on in his bedroom and his boots were gone, so they figured that he must be away at his family's house. He once again doesn't show up for dinner that night, and this time Bud decides to text him, asking where he was. Bud receives no response. To me, this would be a time to start worrying about Justin, because he isn't returning text messages, he hasn't been seen around the trailer at all, he's scheduled to work that evening, and he needs to be home to get a ride with Bud because he doesn't have a driver's license, he has no other way to get to work. Bud still does not check for Justin in his own room or call his family to see what's going on. Instead, he drives into work for his usual shift that evening around midnight. When he arrives, he finds that Justin isn't there and learns that he didn't call or text message the shift manager to let them know that he wouldn't be coming into work that night. Now, this is something that is definitely out of character for Justin to just not show up for work and then to not call or text to let them know. Bud says he just assumed that Justin decided to skip work because he had jokingly mentioned that he might be taking an extra long weekend the last time they worked together. Now, Bud, he works his entire overnight shift, then he drives home in the morning, arriving back at the trailer around 9 a.m., which is now Monday, December the 14th. According to Bud, he goes right to bed to try to get a little bit of sleep. He doesn't check Justin's room at this point, and he doesn't try texting him. But he says he's unable to get to sleep, so he gets up and he begins to look for Justin. Finally, he decides to open the door to Justin's room, and he sees his wallet, which he would never leave home without, and a duffel bag sitting on his bed. 
This is a duffel bag that he was known to use in the past when he would go away for the weekend to visit his family. So Bud figures that he must be somewhere on the property or in the trailer. Glenna tells Bud that someone should probably check Justin's shed to see if he's in there. And when Bud goes in, he finds the shed in disarray. We don't know exactly what is found in the shed. They haven't really released those details. But what we do know is that whatever is found is serious enough to know that something terrible has happened and that the police should be called. I think it's fair to speculate at this point that the shed is likely covered in blood. And we know this because of what police will say later. At about 4.20 later that evening, Glenna called Justin's grandmother to ask if anyone had seen Justin because no one had seen him since Saturday morning, which is now two and a half days later. Justin's grandmother calls his mother, Jamie, to let her know about what Glenna had said, and Jamie immediately panics. Justin would never disappear off the map like that. Her motherly instinct kicks in and she races from work to where Justin was living at the trailer park. On the way, she tried calling Justin's phone over and over again, but there was no answer. According to Justin's mom, Jamie, this is how the following events played out. She said, I then called Glenna, who with a laugh said that they hadn't seen him since Saturday, and in her own words, that's just not like Justin to leave and not say anything. I yelled at her to call the police immediately. When I arrived at their trailer in the Muskoka trailer park, I was informed that the police were almost there by an officer that called me and not to go to the small shed that Justin used because of any evidence that could be there. While I waited for the police, the McKinney's told me their stories. They said Bud and Ken went to Barry on Saturday morning. No mention of Kiara going to Barry, though now they say she went but that Ken didn't. Glenna said she had seen Justin going to his shed around 8.30 a.m. Saturday morning and that no one had seen him since. But the McKinney's waited until Monday at approximately 4.15 to call his family to see if, if he had been seen. They state they thought that he was at my house but by their own words admit that Justin wouldn't just leave without telling them. So now, Justin has been missing for two and a half days, according to the people who claim to have seen him last, the shed is now taped off and being investigated because it's covered in blood. Police even go as far as to say that looking at the condition of the shed, it's not likely that Justin would be found alive. As you can imagine, Justin's family are completely distraught and they want answers. And police say that the disappearance is criminally suspicious. Once the crime scene is examined and documented, the police release it to the family. They come to collect Justin's belongings from the shed and from Justin's bedroom, and noticeably Justin's phone, earbuds, and sunglasses are missing from his belongings. Now let's back things up a little bit here and talk about the days preceding the last time Bud and Kiara reported seeing Justin in Ken's shed. So that was on Saturday, December 12th, but there are some really strange things that happened prior to that that make you wonder if Justin had actually disappeared before Saturday morning. The last time that Justin had been seen at work was Wednesday, December 9th, when he worked his usual overnight shift with Bud. He was also supposed to work the following evening, Thursday, December 10th, but he didn't go in. And what's really strange is that Justin wasn't the one to call or text the shift manager to let him know. It was actually Bud who called in sick for him. But why would Bud call in sick for Justin? Why wouldn't he do it himself? It's just a little strange. Now, we don't know what, if anything, happened the following day, which was Friday, December 11th, but we do know that Justin was supposed to go to a birthday party for a friend that evening, and he never showed up. He didn't go to the party and he didn't text or call to let the friend know that he wouldn't be attending. Then Bud and Kiara report seeing him in Ken's shed the next morning, the morning of Saturday, December 12th. And Glenna says she also fed him breakfast that morning, but she isn't 100% sure if it was Friday or Saturday that she saw him. So we really only have the witness testimony of Bud and Kiara as to when Justin was last seen alive. Other than that, the last reported sighting of Justin was really when he worked that shift over Wednesday night into Thursday morning. 
Now, I want to be clear here. I'm not pointing fingers saying that anyone did anything, but I am clearly stating that there are a lot of strange circumstances and different timestamps that just don't really add up. Things just don't appear to be making sense. There was a lot of back and forth between Justin's family and the McKinney family who Justin lived with before he went missing. A lot of animosity because of how long it took the McKinneys to report Justin missing, which is completely understandable. I mean, I would be pretty pissed off too if I was Justin's mother. Hi, my name is Jules, and I'm the host of Riddle Me That True Crime, which focuses on unsolved murders and disappearances, where I often do so with the help of family members, where they come on and tell their stories, and oftentimes with experts. I'll usually present the story over a multi-episode story arc. Sometimes I'll do one-off episodes, like one I covered recently, which was the tragic and very suspicious death of 14-year-old Noah Donahoe in Belfast, Northern Ireland. So Noah went off on his bike one day. It was Father's Day, the 21st of June, 2020, amidst lockdown. He rides his bike. He's going to Cave Hill Park to meet friends. And something along the route causes him to get derailed. He ends up in an area that he's unfamiliar with and has no business being in, given that he is a Catholic schoolboy and this is a loyalist area. So it takes just under a week until Noah's body is discovered. He's discovered unclothed in a storm drain. And the PSNI comes out with a preliminary conclusion of accident. Mind you, this is before an autopsy has been done to determine manner of death or cause of death. And also before the forensics has been run. The family is screaming out for justice. I really hope you will join me on Riddle Me That True Crime, which you can listen to anywhere you get your podcasts. Now back to our story. On January 18th, 2021, Justin has now been missing for about a month, and Bud takes a moment to post the following to his Facebook page. Here it goes. It says, I feel like I have to make a post about everything going on. I waved to Justin, who was in my dad's shed at 7 a.m. on December 12, 2020, as my girlfriend, Kiara, and I were headed to Barrie for some Christmas shopping with her sister and her boyfriend, not knowing that would be the last time I'd see my best friend. My girlfriend and I got home after dropping her sister and her boyfriend off just before dinner that night around 5.30 to 6 p.m. I had asked if Justin was home. My mom said she hadn't seen him since that morning. For some context, Justin and I worked the midnight shift from midnight to 8 a.m. Mine and Justin's sleep schedules are backwards from one another. He will normally stay awake all morning, then crash whenever he can, and I'll normally go to bed when we get home and get up around 2 p.m. So for the past few years, it hasn't been uncommon for Justin to sleep through dinner if he's not going anywhere on the weekends, because it's hard to flip your schedule as a midnight worker. The next morning when I got up and seen that Justin still wasn't around, I just assumed he'd gone to his mom's as he does most weekends. Justin and I aren't the tell me where you're going or what you're up to every minute of the day type friends. We vent about our problems, hang out, and tell jokes to each other. So I wasn't worried about him till Sunday night came around and he hadn't answered my texts. I went into work to find out that he hadn't called in or texted our crew boss. Justin had joked about taking a long weekend, but for him to not call in or text myself or our crew boss was very strange. Monday morning, I called him a few times and it rang through to his voicemail. That made me worry less because at the time, I thought that all phones worked the same and would only ring through if the phone was on. I also know that Justin could sleep through an alarm even if it was taped to his forehead. So I tried to get some rest and let him wake up and text me back. I couldn't sleep and got up around 12 p.m. and started to look for him. I looked in his room and found his travel bag, charger, and wallet. After that, my mom suggested I check his shed to see if maybe he came home and was sitting out there smoking his pot and listening to his book. I found his shed in disarray and called his parents and the police once they said he wasn't there for the weekend. I then went asking our neighbors if they'd seen him. I've sadly learned since then that most cell phones ring through, so the caller doesn't think they're being ignored. Justin and I were like brothers. 
We help each other out through shit, from family stuff to weird bodily functions, it didn't matter. Justin, years ago, jokingly adopted the saying, we're best fucking friends and that means your bullshit is my bullshit and my bullshit is your bullshit. We would remind one another about that even years later, especially when one of us noticed something was wrong with the other. Justin and I have known each other since kindergarten. That's 16 years I've had the amazing opportunity to call him my best friend and have had the privilege of him calling me his best friend. Justin never seemed off the week leading up to that day, other than he'd made a mistake and hurt himself on a snowmobile the weekend before and was hurting quite a bit. It never mattered what it was, Justin and I would push through it together, whether it was kindergarten spelling bees, learning to drive, or family problems. We had each other's backs and would help one another stand. We'd never let the other fall no matter how hard it got. And then in cap locks, it says, so for some of you pieces of shit to go running to the damn cops on Facebook telling people I might have killed Justin with no better reason than I think or I heard when you barely know us is a fucking joke. You're pathetic. Fuck you. You walk around claiming you know something. You barely know your head from your ass. And then it goes back to normal type. If you know something helpful, like where you might have seen him, please go to the OPP. Crime Stoppers, something. There are dozens of links for anonymous reports, and I've heard there's money for anyone who brings forward any information about him that helps find him. Please, I've walked around our area and talked to some people, but no one seems to know anything. If it was a vehicle or people that seemed out of place around then, please say something. It doesn't matter if it was in the Kilworthy area, Gravenhurst, Aurelia, Bracebridge, it doesn't matter if it was a weird vehicle or persons. Please, it only takes a moment for a call or email that might bring an end to what's been a very long and hard month for his family and friends. Again, please, any information that could bring him home would be greatly appreciated. I'm tired of the theories. I want the facts. Have you seen or heard anything or even been somewhere you think he might be? Thank you to everyone who's given helpful information. Without you, we'd be no closer to having answers. So, yeah, things are tense. People are pointing fingers, lies are being told, and Justin is still missing. This same month in January, there's a sudden death of another resident of the trailer park where Justin lives, and the police begin to investigate it as a suspicious death. The person is another young man around Justin's age who used to hang out with Justin every once in a while. They would have bonfires together, things like that. Police aren't sure at the time if the two are related, but it does come out later that this death is believed to be a suicide by train. On Wednesday, May 19th, five months since Justin was last seen alive, police were called after a hiker discovered human remains. The body was found close to the trailer park Justin lived in, actually just about four blocks away from where his trailer was located in this somewhat swampy area. It would be confirmed to be the body of Justin. Immediately, Justin's family were shocked and upset that Justin's body was found so close to where he was last seen. The police had told them previously that they had searched all of the area surrounding the park, but now they were saying that this area hadn't been previously searched. While the body is being examined and the family waits for answers, Ken McKinney, Bud's grandfather, is arrested and charged with obstructing justice. This charge stems from the statement that he gave police where he said that he was in Barrie with Bud and Kiara the day that Justin went missing, which turned out to be a lie, which is like, why would you lie about something like that? It felt like it was only a matter of time until more charges would be coming, but they didn't. And then things took a shocking turn. On June 1st, police announced that they don't believe that Justin Evans was murdered. They claimed that they do not believe they were investigating a homicide or that Justin's death was criminally suspicious. And if not murder, that obviously means that they believe that Justin's death was either a suicide or an accidental death. And what's really crazy is that they made this announcement despite waiting on toxicology and pathology results from Justin's autopsy. The case was changed from a suspicious disappearance to an ongoing death investigation. 
Of course, the family did not believe that Justin had killed himself, not for a second. Justin's mother said that he and his sisters were planning a trip to Cuba. He also spoke of wanting to visit family in Vancouver. He recently got a new cell phone and he had already purchased Christmas gifts for family and friends. So he was clearly planning for the future and he didn't seem to be in any way suicidal. But let's put all of that aside for a minute because I understand sometimes it can be difficult for families to accept that a loved one has completed suicide. But what about the evidence? The shed where Justin was last seen was reported to contain so much blood that the police did not believe he could have survived whatever had happened there. So now we're supposed to believe that Justin tried to kill himself there. Then, while bleeding out, he dragged himself about a kilometer down the road past other trailers and then he just died in a swamp alone. And while he did that, he also apparently left no trail of blood behind him. And if it were accidental, not a suicide, he would obviously call for help or go to a neighbor for help. He wouldn't just start walking towards the swamp. He's in an area surrounded by other trailers. To me, this is the clearest piece of evidence that Justin's death is highly suspicious. And where is his phone? Still to this day, his phone has not been recovered and neither have his earbuds. Like, if he was going to commit suicide, or if it was an accidental death, you would think he would have his phone with him. Young people do not leave anywhere without their cell phone. Justin's favorite pair of white glasses did, however, surface on Bud's head. He was seen in recent photos wearing the sunglasses, and when he was asked about them, he said that he had bought them off of Justin before his disappearance. It doesn't make much sense to me, that he would buy an old beat up pair of sunglasses off of Justin. And this was a pair that Justin wore every single day, but okay. Then on June 5th, Bud made another Facebook post regarding Justin. And to me, this one is just horrific. It makes my stomach turn. I'm going to read it to you now. Here it goes. I have been keeping quiet about this for a long time now, and I think it's only right that it is shared. I believe Justin is gay. In all of the times I've known Justin, he has never taken a relationship with a girl seriously and has never cared about being broken up with or breaking up with them. The last time Justin was in a relationship was high school, and since then, he never talked about girls. We would talk about relationships, but it was never specifically about girls, and he would be vague and keep those conversations short. Shortly after Justin went missing, people messaged Kiara to tell her Justin was on Grindr. Grindr is a dating app for people in the LGBTQ plus community, to my understanding. Lots of people questioned Justin's sexuality. He was a very flamboyant person. I feel that Justin might have been getting closer to coming out because when we had went for a road trip one weekend, the topic of LGBTQ plus communities was brought up and we had told him that if he was gay, that he was more than welcome to tell us. I told him that his secret would be safe with us and I would never judge him for that. Usually when this topic was brought up, Justin would get defensive, listen to what people had to say and shove it off. This time, though, Justin just said, thank you, I really appreciate that. Later on that day, we had stopped somewhere and Justin confided in us and told us he didn't like when people asked him that because one time a family member called him, put him on speaker, and began to ask him over and over if he was gay and to just admit it. Justin said there was a roar of laughter on the other end of the phone and that he had never been so humiliated in his life. I kept this quiet for such a long time because I felt like I was betraying Justin if I told people this information. Justin, if he was, wasn't out of the closet, and I did not want to be the one to share it. Justin deserved so much more, and if I could have told him one more thing that day, it would have been that he was loved no matter who he loved. One of my theories since the beginning was that Lucas and Justin had a secret relationship and things went south. I never really seen anyone at Lucas, only once in a while. Lucas lived alone, and I'm pretty sure he was close-ish to Justin's age. I truly believed that someone murdered Justin right up until now, but we are somewhat relieved that, if it was a suicide, that Justin was ready to leave and no one made him go. It's still devastating that he is gone, but it's more comforting knowing his life wasn't just ripped away. 
This is all just a theory, but it's been stuck with me since the beginning. I hope heaven is treating you well, buddy. I love you and miss you. Now, to clarify, Lucas is the young man who died by suicide about a month after Justin disappeared. So now Bud is claiming that Justin and Lucas were actually in a relationship. And this, now this is supposed to be his best friend who has been found deceased from suicide, according to him. Now you're going to out him regarding something so private and personal? This is a public Facebook post that he's made on his profile and the settings are set to public so you can even go to his profile and read it to this day. Whether Justin was gay or not makes absolutely no difference to the case. It feels like a distraction and it really just makes my stomach turn that he would do this to his deceased friend. Justin isn't here to say otherwise. Now, things have been quiet for the last month or so regarding Justin's death, but I have a very important update that just happened in the last 24 hours. Justin's mother, Jamie, posted in the Justice for Justin Facebook group the following. In caps, it says, Ruled not a suicide. After almost three months, the coroner finally called. There's more information coming soon, but I wanted to get this information out there. We told them he wouldn't do that and they were wrong, but they wouldn't listen. My son was murdered. OPP failed Justin. So to me, this sounds like this could be the beginning of getting answers and justice for Justin Evans. This is a case that I am, of course, going to be following closely. And this is one that we'll be chatting about over on my Serial Society True Crime Discussion Facebook group chat. Our next Zoom chat will be the last Sunday of this month, so the very end of August, and hopefully we have some more details by then and we can start to piece some things together. We'll be taking a closer look at Justin's story, the evidence, the key players, and of course, I'll be sure to keep you updated as new information is revealed. To end this episode, let me make it clear. I do not believe that Justin killed himself. Nothing about this story adds up to suicide. I have no idea who killed Justin or who was involved in any of this, but I do believe that the truth always comes out and it sounds like it's coming out soon. That's it for me tonight. If you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Mapper. You can also search for me on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper, or I'm on YouTube, Nikki Young, Serial Napper, all one word. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you give me a thumbs up and subscribe. If you'd like to become a Patreon member and unlock some badass bonuses, including ad-free exclusive episodes, merch, giveaways, and so much more, make sure you visit patreon.com slash Serial Napper. Until next time, don't be a Dahmer. Bye.